this idea of building a business around something we just did as kids, running obstacles, is in so many ways mind-boggling. The number one question I get is what made you think of this? I grew up in Queens, New York, a very uh, traditional Italian neighborhood, lots of organized crime, ganolis, raviolis, poor lifestyle. And my mom, seeking a different way, goes and finds a yogi in probably the only health food store on the East Coast at the time. And that yogi infuses these ideas into her head that we need to challenge ourselves, we need to take cold showers, we need to run long distances, do yoga and meditate. I don't want any part of it. But for at least 15 years, I listened to that from my mom. Fast forward, took on a regular life, found a career, found myself sitting in a chair making money on a computer screen, and it was not fulfilling. I didn't feel healthy. So I started to compete in these crazy events, and I felt alive. But you've basically built an industry. How did you think this could be a business and really get it going? I'm a big believer in fire, ready, aim. If you lay it out on a spreadsheet and you get the smartest, minds in the room, they're gonna say this will never work. We had so many events going on in so many places that there was like a network effect. I didn't think it was gonna be this big. Maybe globally, 50,000 people. What are you up to now? Over 10 million people have competed in one of our races. How do you figure out how to get people to do what they don't want to? Welcome everyone to this episode of the Liberty Ventures podcast. My name is Alexander McCobin, founder and CEO of Liberty Ventures. We're doing this live from Richard Branson's Necker Island for the Principled Business Summit. And I say this all the time, but even more so than usual, I am super excited to be talking with Joe DeSena, the founder of Spartan Racing. Joe, it really is an honor to have you on here. You are one of my business heroes, one of my heroes in life, Would and you? I just can't say how much I respect you and appreciate everything that you've done. I appreciate that. Tell my wife, because my family does not, <laughs> they don't appreciate me at home, you know? And I need a couple of people to talk to her. I've met Courtney here. I know that's not true, but I will still hype you up for her just because I hype you up to everyone. Appreciate that. Really, I, I just, You've talked about the founding of Spartan Racing in a number of interviews before, so I don't want the usual story, but since we're here at Necker Island, as I understand, this was the, the place of perhaps the first race that you put on. Is that right? It's true. Back in 2000, 25 years ago, back in 2000, I was working on Wall Street. My passion was competing in races all over the world, and I knew a bunch of people on Tortola, on an island right next door. And so came up with the idea that we were going to put on a race in the British Virgin Islands and it was going to be 350 miles long and it would include sailing and biking and coastaleering and swimming and we came down we planned it right here right in these waterways <laughs> Peter Island Tortol like it was unbelievable right Jos van Dyck and I went and competed just before September 11th the race was the race was gonna be November 2001. I went and competed in Switzerland at a race called the Discovery Channel World Championships that September. When I landed in New York with my soon-to-be bride, who you met, Courtney, we were gonna have breakfast September 11th morning in the towers. We decided to not have breakfast. We had breakfast somewhere else put her on a plane to Boston. I went into my office, which was right across the street from the towers, and we know what happened. Everybody told me to cancel the race, which was in two months in BVI, and I said, because I was so close to it, I was so passionate, I said, no, we're not gonna, they're not gonna stop us from doing what we're doing. So I committed to it. There's a turtle going by us in the background here. <laughs> and, and we did it. And while we were setting up the course, one of the guys that was setting the ropes, he was a contractor for us, very few people know this story, cut his leg. And my team said, go get stitches on Tortola, take that dinghy, a little boat with a, with a motor on it, take that dinghy, shoot back to Tortola, get stitches, recover, and we got this. Eight days later, post-race, I find out that no one has seen him since that moment. Oh my gosh. He's gone. I lose my mind because I'm like, how do, you, how do you tell me eight days later? I don't know if down here in the British Virgin Islands, negligence is, is like, are they going to put me in jail? Is it elite? Like, so we reach out to Branson. We rent his, borrow his helicopter. He gives us his pilot, his helicopter. My father-in-law is a, um, a Navy pilot. He jumps in the plane with him. 
and they start searching. Very hard to search in these waterways, by the way, for a, a speck in the ocean. We grab the Coast Guard. Coast Guard lays out their maps in front of me. There's a terrible storm. There's no chance this guy's alive. And they go to Little Tobago, which is 150 miles away. And sure enough, he had drifted. The engine did not work on the dinghy when he got in, and he drifted away for eight days, and he landed on Little Tobago. And Sports Illustrated did a story on it. True, alive. True survivor. He was alive. He ate crabs and drank bottled water that had drifted to the island. And he was awesome when he got off the chopper. He said, let's go get dinner. He didn't, <laughs> he didn't want to kill me. And, you know, when you think about the start of any business, of any career, any relationship, a start like that probably stops you in your tracks. But I'm a glutton for punishment. And, and from there, we did a second race and a third race and a fourth race. And here we are today. That is a wild story on so many levels. But, you know, even just the concept of starting a business around obstacle course racing, when you did so, there was nothing like this at the time. And I remember my first race as a, it was a Tough mutter over a decade ago. It was still a brand new thing. This idea of building a business around something we just did as kids, running obstacles, is in so many ways mind boggling, even still to me. It's the number one question I get around the world is what made you think of this? And as you asked the question, I just went into my head and I started thinking, you know, I grew up in Queens, New York. It was a very uh, traditional Italian neighborhood, lots of organized crime, ganolis, raviolis, poor lifestyle. And my mom, seeking a different way, goes and finds a yogi in probably the only health food store on the East Coast at the time. And that yogi infuses these ideas into her head that we need to challenge ourselves, we need to take cold showers, we need to run long distances, we need to do yoga, meditate, become vegan. I don't want any part of it. But for at least 15 years, I listened to that from my mom nonstop. Fast forward, took on a regular life like everybody takes on, found a career, found myself sitting in a chair making money on a computer screen, and it was not fulfilling, and I didn't feel healthy. And so I started to compete in these crazy events, and I felt alive. I mean, we had a mantra, uh, my team and I, when we would race, it, you know, if you're not tired, you're sleeping too much. If you're not hungry, you're eating too much. If you're not cold, you're wearing too much. So like, the idea was like, you need to be pushing yourself. Now, before you even ask the question, if this was the 1700s and we were doing this podcast, I would say, you know what we need? More couches, more penicillin, more Netflix. Because life was tough back then. But come on, this is a joke. We're sitting, we're sitting on couches here. We've got everything at our disposal. We've got food being made for us. We've got turtles in the back. Like, there's no, there's no <laughs> real threats. Um, so we need... We need more of what we sell. The problem, big problem, the problem is the human brain, and I believe you spoke, the woman behind the camera spoke about this today, I speak about it all the time, which is the human brain wants to avoid discomfort at all costs. More than sex, drugs, and rock and roll, like the human brain is like, time out, too dangerous, don't go in the rain, you're gonna drown, don't go in the sun, you're gonna melt, don't go near that cliff, you're gonna fall off, don't do that workout, it expends too much energy, uh, don't eat that salad, to your point. So like we're selling something that's really hard to sell. We're selling Very. discipline, commitment, all the things your brain doesn't want. Things people don't inherently want. You don't right want now. it. You don't want it. So so very tough business. Like if we were selling lollipops rather than burpees, it'd be a lot easier. Not so, as fulfilling, but a lot easier. Temporarily perhaps, but you've basically built an industry, and this is actually reminding me a lot of the story of John Mackey building out the natural food space, who's also here at the summit, where when he started Whole Foods as Safer Way, wasn't something people really wanted. They wanted the junk food, they wanted the bad stuff, but he said this is better for them and that in order to change people's diets, you need to build a business to make it sustainable. Was that sort of your motivation as well behind Spartan then? Well, so from that race I told you about that happened here, fast forward 10 years from 2001, to 2010, I put on races every year, all over the place, Vermont, uh, Long Island, you name it. And I would rope people in like you. If you were my buddy, I'd rope you in. And you didn't want to do it. And so I had to lie to, I had to, lie to you. It became a thing where I was lying to everybody. I would say, hey, come over to my house for a barbecue this weekend, but it wasn't really a barbecue. <laughs> and, and I couldn't make the business work. I just, you know, John Mackey, in the beginning, probably was having a really tough time getting people to buy salads. So, but I was passionate about it, and I knew that if people did it, 
you know, they say if you want to be successful, right? You, you, like, are you the kind of person that even though you're failing, you'll keep leaning in, you'll keep doing it. I just, I kept leaning in because I, I believed in it. I was passionate about it. I watched my mom change lives. I changed my life. But I never thought, I didn't think it was going to be this big. I, I mean, I thought maybe there were 50,000 people like you, maybe globally, 50,000 people. That, and that was a lot. It was a lot. That would be a lot. Yeah. But what are you up to now? Over 10 million people have competed in one of our races. It's a big number. That's a huge number. There's 50,000 Spartan tattoos. 50,000 tattoos. One guy tattooed our logo on his face. <laughs> Sent me an email. He's like, hey, what do you think? I got... I didn't even know how to respond, so I wrote back. I said, hey, we just changed the logo. <laughs> he was not happy. So when, when you were getting this off the ground and still just trying to figure out the business model, really, I want to dig into that. How did you think this could be a business and really get it going? You know, I'm a big believer in fire, ready, aim. I don't think, mm. I don't think if we sit around and lay out the spreadsheet that many things that happened in our life, which are great, like a Whole Foods, like a Tesla, like you go down the list, uh, uh, SpaceX. If you lay it out on a spreadsheet and you get the smartest minds in the room to sit, they're gonna say this will never work. And so I didn't have a, a path to it working. I just knew that it changed my life. It changed everybody that I lied to's life, uh, that I got to you know, do one of these crazy things. And I don't know, could I get 700 people to an event? Could I get a thousand people to an event? And if I did, we'd see what that looked like. And you kept pushing yourself to build up those numbers just yeah, to get them out to, to it. just to see what would happen. And then one day, one day in the office, we all worked in one little office in Vermont and everybody got paid $2,000 a month because that's all we could afford with everything else we had going on. And I had this, this great Asian accountant, Chris, and he was a master on spreadsheets. He was tracking the registrations. He had, a, he had a mattress in the office. He slept in the office. Like we were like, this was the bunker team. And I go, hey, your spreadsheet must be off. There were like 1,100 signups yesterday. To like, and he goes back and he's like, no, <laughs> no, it's not, it's working. And I was like, what the hell happened? And I think what happened was we had so many events going on in so many places that there was like a network effect. Somebody saw the photo from you, somebody saw her photo, doing these, like, and it just became a thing. You hit a tipping point. We hit a tipping point. I want to dig into that because you did what most business schools and what a lot of investors tell the, tell the companies they, they invest in to not do. Don't change consumer demand or consumer preferences. Lean into what they want. And you figured out a way in order to change what a lot of people actively want. And you keep pushing for them to change that. We keep pushing for them to change. We're definitely swimming upstream in doing that. But, you know, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, you also have to, you have to have some principles and, right? Like, like, again, there are many ways to make money, but what I feel good about it, what I feel good about it, and I feel really good about this. I mean, I get an email, at least one email every single day. I'm back with my wife, I'm back with my husband. I gave up drinking, I gave up drugs. I started a business, I didn't kill myself. I survived being stabbed. Every day I get these emails, every day. So I wouldn't get those if we sold lollipops. Probably quite the opposite. Probably quite the opposite, so. Now, I'm gonna ask the same question a slightly different way because your wife suggested that, that I ask this. How do you figure out how to get people to do what they don't instinctively want to? You know, like you personally. My dad, we grew up in that neighborhood. My dad had this really unbelievable technique that we, me and my friends reflect on later, my family, my friends, of getting us to do things we did not plan on doing. You know, people would come over and we're going to watch a TV show. Next thing you know, we're hanging sheetrock. How, <laughs> how did that happen? Right? Like he very oh, Tom Sawyer. Yes, very Tom. My dad was amazing at it, and I picked up that ability. So I get people to do things they had no, it was not in their, you know, in their, in their plan that day or that week or even in their life. I get them to do things. And I don't know, I have an instinct. I can tell whether like, like 
I don't know, giving you positive reinforcement or actually telling you you'll never be able to get this. I just have an instinct when I meet people what, what that trigger is going to be for them. And yeah, I've had people come up to me and said, you know, I ran into a year ago and I thought you were going to give me a pat on the back and you said something. And so now I'm here and I'm doing the death race. I'm like, I don't even remember doing that, <laughs> but, but I'm glad you're getting this death race done. I mean, you just did that for me with your end of year challenge That's right. between Christmas and New Year's. Do I'm either a 10 at, mile run, 20, bu yeah. 20 mile bike ride, 300 burpees. And it's just inspiring. It just makes you want to go and push yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, you know, everybody has their thing. That's, that's my superpower. Now, I have read in other interviews that one of the books that's really influenced you is Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. And yeah. I'm, I'm curious to learn a little bit more about that. When did you read Atlas Shrugged and I, how did that impact I you? I probably read it early, in, late high school, early college. And I mean, it's clear when you read that book or Fountainhead or, or start to understand her philosophy that that's me. I'm, you know, and I, I'm thinking back to my dad, he was, he was just a big believer in uh, this Dar Darwinian theory, like we have to fight to survive. And then, then as I was building my first business as a young preteens, I had uh, lots of neighborhood kids work for me and they were terrible, terrible. Didn't want to work, <laughs> didn't know what their purpose was, all this nonsense. And then I hired Eastern Europeans. I stumbled upon Eastern Europe, real Eastern Europeans, like before the wall came down. And mm. they outworked me. I was, the, I was the business owner. They were outworking me. They were unbelievable. <laughs> and so that, that idea, that philosophy, uh, there's another great book, by the way. If anybody knows Anne Rand, there's a great book that you would love. Read A Message to Garcia. It was written in the late 1800s by Ron L. Hubbard's dad, the Scientology guy's dad, who, oh, who, interesting. who believed in the same like work ethic, hardcore. And so, and so what we're talking about is not unique to this generation. This was being talked about in the 1800s and the 1700s. They don't work the way they used to, these kids. Right? It's been going on forever. And, and he wrote this book, A Message to Garcia. And basically, not to ruin the book, the U.S. and Cuba is going to go to war. U.S. president has to get a message to Garcia, the Cuban president. It's the only way to stop the war. He calls somebody into his office, the president, and he says, all right, look, I need you to get this letter. And the first thing out of the guy's mouth is, well, like, why am I doing this exactly? Get the fuck out of my office. Next guy comes in and finally he goes through six, seven people and Rowan walks in and Rowan's like, I got it. Give me the address. And he swims and he fights alligators and he goes through the jungle and he gets the Cuba and he stops the war. And the point is we should all be a little more Rowan. So this, this is like, you know, Shackleton, the endurance. I lean into those amazing stories, that philosophy of like, suck it up, buttercup, and let's get this done. Here, here. Here, here. And there's so, that applies to so many uh, ventures in life. It's not just exercise in our physical health, it's business, it's our mental health, it's yeah, our relationships. Yeah, now my, my wife, if she was sitting here, she would say, you know, he needs to relax. He needs to calm down, <laughs> he's way too intense. I don't understand why he can't just relax. He's on Richard Branson's island and he just wants to work. And um, maybe, but I, my answer to that would be like, you, you want roses, everybody wants roses, but like who's gonna trim them and, and water them and, and uh, give them nutrients? Like somebody's gotta do the work. It reminds me of the old proverb of what is enlightenment? Well, before enlightenment, you chop the wood, you clean the dishes, you make the dinner. <laughs> ah, then after enlightenment, you chop the wood, you clean the dishes, you make the dinner. That's how you get to be able to relax. I love that, I love that. I love, by the way, I have a sickness if you guys haven't noticed yet, whoever's listening or watching this, but um, if I see movies of, of chopping wood, carrying water, like, I, I'm like, I like that. I like when I see a movie with, <laughs> with you know, somebody's trapped in like Greenland on, in the ice for three years, I'm like, like I wanna be there. So, so You wanna see if you can overcome that. You wanna think yeah, about what I, it takes to overcome It just looks that. like happy to me. I don't know why, that's where I wanna be. Well, it's a psychological principle that, that's really been revealed that people aren't happy when they get what they want. It's right. the pursuit of what we want right. and the struggle and overcoming the challenges that gives us the, hap the real sense of happiness and why we always want the next thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're, if you're just given that dopamine hit, it's not nearly. You know, somebody, uh, I had a buddy of mine scan my brain. Hmm. He's got a, this guy, a friend of mine, Tommy, he's got a company called Nestry and he's able to put a cap on your head and he's able to ask you some questions or whatever and look at your brain. And he said to me, he goes, do you have an opioid addiction? I was like, I never took an opioid in my life. I don't do drugs, <laughs> I don't drink. But 
what we determined is like I get so much fulfillment from doing hard like I don't I don't need it from a pill. I like I, I get it from doing the hard work. <laughs> and so I've opened up all those pathways, like do some burpees, feel great. I mean, that sounds like the dream, frankly. That is the dream. Mm -hmm. Living the dream. Now, I know we've got a few more. Uh, there, there's a lot more I want to ask, but I know we want to do burpees at some point yeah. in this interview. Okay. We got to do some burpees. We'll, we'll do them in a little bit then so we keep yeah. going. So back to Spartan. You've already done so much with this. It's beyond anything it's, you ever dreamed when you started. And we were talking beforehand, it's going to be an Olympic sport, an Olympic event in 2028 now too. So or when I, when I was- course racing. Yeah, when I was a kid, for a moment, I raced BMX bicycles and BMX went in and out of favor. Skateboarding went in and out of favor. So when we started this, I thought we have to lean in and somehow make this a sport. I had no idea how you would take an idea and turn it into a legit sport, let alone an Olympic sport. But I started just saying, I just started saying to the universe, there's gonna be an Olympic sport, there's gonna be an Olympic sport. I got you know, articles written about how it's gonna be an Olympic sport and then people started calling me and next thing you know, an Olympic committee came out to one of our events and looked at things and we teamed up with Pentathlon. Pentathlon, modern Pentathlon, if you go way, way back, it actually doesn't look too far. You know, it's not too far from what we, what we were, what we are. And so we teamed up with Modern Pentathlon. They're removing, they removed the uh, equestrian section and they put an obstacle section. And so that's the first step. That'll be 2028 in LA, huge deal. Signed the deal with um, the Prince of uh, Monaco, which was awesome in Bath, England. I had, I had a, um, one of our customers, he's like six, six and a half feet tall. He, if you guys know the Stig, it, it, there's a British show, a race car show, where the Stig always has a white helmet on, white outfits, white gloves, and you never see him, he never speaks. We created a Spartan Stig, white Spartan <laughs> helmet, white, and I had the Stig show up for when I was meeting with the Prince. And so the Stig, I gotta show you the pictures, six and a half foot tall, muscular guy, all in white, Spartan, just silent over here. And I said to the Prince, I said, who's your bodyguard? And they go, Bruno, I go, my bodyguard looks a lot tougher than Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. And yeah. you've reached 10 million people already with this. So what's next? What's your next big vision? Well, so the vision, the vision for us is I want to be the Louis Vuitton of hard shit, right? So, so I don't know what's going to get you excited. Is it going to be a mountain bike race? Is it going to be a hiking event? Is it going to... So as long as it's really friggin' hard, and I could build it into a brand that you, whoever you are, get excited about. Those will be verticals in our business, and we'll be all, we're already all over the world, um, but actually executing that, turning that from, a, from an idea into um, an actually, you know, and, and I'm reeling, I'm reeling hard coming out of COVID. COVID we got destroyed. Oh yeah. Destroyed, the universe was so mad at me for the, 90 million burpees I made people do that uh, they gave me they gave me COVID so it like shut me down no it was just another challenge another hardship for us to get over to get back to what we loved it's because like, it's I like was a 42,000 foot long rope climb I mean it, it was a nightmare I, I I can believe it because I was at the first Spartan race to open up after COVID Jacksonville. In, in Jacksonville that's yeah. right yeah. and you were telling me before that there were people and I remember people, people were crying, crying crying just started tearing up and crying couldn't believe they were back outside um, yeah, but we, we got killed. We got killed. It is an absolute testament to the team we have, to the customers we have, that we, we didn't have to go bankrupt. We somehow survived this thing. Um, miraculous. Okay, so what does it mean to be the Louis Vuitton of hard shit? Well, it means you've got multiple brands, just like Louis Vuitton does, right? You mm. share back office um, synergies. You, you get to distribute globally um, your other brands, like Spartan's already paved the way in all these countries, has everything all set up. How do we, how do we get trail races being pushed out there, functional fit, fitness events, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I, I can see a world someday where you're a member, a paying member, and you've got access to everything around the world. Mm. Could be interesting. That's exciting. Yeah. Really exciting. Because I need to keep you and you with things on your calendar, because if you don't have things on your calendar, and, and you know, you just, the woman behind the camera just got engaged. <laughs> we have a wedding business in Vermont. And what I saw with that wedding business was the bride and the groom would show up. They'd be one size in shape. 
And then when it was time for the wedding, they'd be a much better size and shape. And I thought, wow, they had a date on the calendar. And so when we humans have dates on the calendar, we get after it because we're afraid. We don't, we don't want to fail, right? Like a boxer puts a date on the calendar. They got a big boxing mat. They don't want to lose. An Olympian, you know, like a rocket. Elon Musk has to launch the rocket on this day. They got to get their shit together. It makes it very tangible. And you know that you can't push, when you can't push that date back, You've got to get it done gotta, by that. You've got to deliver. My dad, used, my dad um, had a moment where he was in the air freight business. He said, you know what makes us good? I said, no, what makes you good? He said, the plane leaving at 7 p.m. requires that we deliver the freight on time. Like, and I was like, oh, I see. Okay, I get it. Looking back on, on everything and building up Spartan, if you were to give advice to your younger self when you were just starting out with this, especially in the context of other entrepreneurs who are inspired by what you're doing. Well, what, what big, mis you, yeah, big mistake give? I made in the early days was... I didn't really invest in any infrastructure because I didn't believe it was going to be what it became. So hmm. had, I, had I invested in those early days in te technological infrastructure, even, even logistics and shipping, et cetera, um, customer uh, databases, I just, there's only going to be 50,000 people. Like, I, like I, I don't need to do all that stuff. And I'm definitely more Flintstone than I am Jetson. So I lean, <laughs> I lean that way. But, but if I had to do it again, I would have been setting up, setting the foundation for what ultimately was going to be a, a giant building. That is incredibly good advice. Yeah. Even for us as we're building out Liberty Ventures, it's a reminder for us to put the infrastructure yeah, in place. Yeah, get it in place because, I mean, I've, we've probably filmed, I'm going to make up a number that's probably not too far off. We've probably filmed 10,000 hours of footage, 10,000 hours, like a ridiculous amount of footage. How, how do I organize all that? Why didn't I start organizing it from the beginning? I want to ask you also about your social media presence because it is prolific, it is impressive. And do you, I'm curious, how do you feel about social media and you, all that footage that you've got? So when we started, remember, I started back in 2001. Social media didn't exist. Around 2009, 2010, when we changed the name to Spartan, social media came into play and it was having a profound impact on what we were doing. And I thought, you know, I'm the anti-social media. I'm not doing any social media. We're on a farm in Vermont. If you want to get to know who we are, you come to the farm. And that was my, that was my shtick. That was my thing. I believed it. I really did not want to do this stuff. And probably 2014, 2015, actually later for me personally, I came into it later. Um, had I done it earlier, it would, be much be it would have been much better for our business had I leaned in as the CEO, as the founder earlier. But I just, I didn't want to do it. I don't want to do it. So how do you really, feel about it, now? It's a necessary evil because on the one hand, I'm saying stay off social media, come out and do these things, live, right? Learn to live. On the other hand, I look at my kids, I look at my friend, I look at everybody and everybody's staring at their phone all day, every day. So that's the place. I got to meet them where they are. Of course. And hopefully I can get them excited with some visual that where they say, let me drop the phone and go do something real. That sounds like you've given the explanation right there. You're not trying to get people on social media and keep them there. You're no. tapping into the place where they shouldn't be to try and convince them to get off trying and go get, into the real world. Trying to convince them to get off. And we, I also have a bone to pick with your buddy with, um, what is it, Love Sack? Sean. Yeah, Sean. I got a bone to pick with him. I mean, he's, mm -hmm. he's creating these couches, which, which is, uh, you know, causing a pandemic of, of softness. <laughs> I mean, it is true. If you sit down in one of the Love Sack beanie, be, uh, beanbag chairs, it's tough to get out of those. Quite to literally out. tough to there, physically there get out go. of them. I mean, I could see he should, he should join us in, in what we're doing, and, and we should have beds of nails. That's what we should do. Or you get those Love Sack be, beanie bag chairs for the end of the Spartan races, put them in the VIP area back there. That's one of the perks of, at the end that. of the race. You could do that maybe with like <laughs> an electric current where every once in a while we zap people to get them up and out. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, I just again, I just so appreciate everything that you're doing, appreciate you sharing all these insights and wisdom and know that we've got to get ready for some more stuff tonight. So I'm going to let you go soon. Let's but do a couple burpees. Let's do some burpees. I will say, uh, Joe, I don't know if I really did any burpees until I started doing Spartan races, and that's because I failed so many obstacles in the beginning that I had to do a lot of them to get going. And this is a core part of the Spartan brand. It's a big, it's a big thing. You know, very early on, what happened was we were, we were having people go through these obstacles, and they were skipping them. And I thought, this is a, this is a problem, so I need to come up with something that's super healthy but super painful, <laughs> where, where they're going to... They're going to rather do the obstacle. They're going to rather train for the obstacle at home. 
And so the burpee was infused into Sp it really became synonymous with Spartan, um, so much so that um, there were like riots, literal uh, global riots to remove the burpee. Like, uh, yes, I'm, I'm doing 300 burpees at a race. This is so ridiculous. Like we can't, there's no way I could win the race if I missed the spear throw. It became a thing. Well, that's the point. You gotta, you gotta be able to do the obstacles you, if you wanna win the race. You gotta be able to do the obstacles. So, so the burpee, everybody out there watching, right? Like I would argue, it's probably the world's greatest exercise because you could do it in a hotel room. You could do it anywhere. You're gonna get horizontal, you're gonna get vertical, you're gonna move a ton of blood. You wanna live a long life, you gotta move blood. Let's go down, right? Chest to ground, we just hang out here. Come up, jump up. Down, chest to ground, come up, jump up. And that's it, right? I mean, that's the, that's the deal. You wanna be um, super healthy, you wanna be super fit. You probably could do at a minimum, what, 30 burpees a day? What do you think? At least. Right? You do 30 burpees a day at That's one obstacle you miss. At a minimum. And before you know it, oh, you're going to love this. So, I'm in the middle of building this business. We got burpees going on everywhere. And I get interviewed on 60 Minutes. And I'm telling them about the burpee. And the guy interviewing me says, you know, I met a guy named Big Evil. So I go, who's Big Evil? They go, Big Evil was the founder of like the Bloods or the Crips. One of those gangs out in California. And Big Evil is doing life in prison. And he's in solitary confinement. And Big Evil is ripped and shredded. And we interviewed him for 60 minutes. And we asked Big Evil, how do you look so good? So I do a thousand burpees a day. So I knew, I knew we were onto something. So that's what we do. All right. Brilliant. Is that good? Joe.